Welcome everybody to today's Transfer Express webinar, quality photography for your t-shirt business. Jerry, getting us started with a question right off the bat. Will we get a copy of the notes? Yes, Jerry, you will. Um, if you have joined me before, then you know I am Andy Curtis with Transfer Express. I am the Learning and Development Manager and Customer Service Manager here at Transfer Express. It is my pleasure to join you generally the second Thursday of every month for these webinars. Um, if you have been with us before, you know that we record these webinars for you. They will show up on our website. Uh, usually it takes a day or so. Um, and uh, the uh, recording will be available to you. You'll be able to check it all out. Um, if you want a copy of slides, we can do that for you. You just got to shoot us an email. Let us know you want a copy of slides. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, you'll definitely get notes from this, Jerry. So good question right off the bat. <laughs> anyway, welcome, everybody, to today's webinar. Uh, I hope it's as beautiful where you're at as it is here. We are finally over winter in Northeast Ohio, although I, maybe I shouldn't have said that out loud. I don't know. Um, uh, all I know is that the groundhog lied when he said early spring lying groundhog <laughs> so anyway um today's webinar is going to be great everybody because this is a topic that uh it doesn't get covered a heck of a lot it's one of those things that any of us who have a retail space online or even some of us with the retail space physically um this is a topic that we have to deal with and it's kind of funny how there's not necessarily a lot of resources out there for us specifically um and it's kind of a funny topic because, uh, as usual, I have some experience here. Um, I, I know the position that a lot of you guys are in. Our mom and pop customers, our smaller retail customers, you're not photographers. You get thrown into this head first and you, you find yourself having to, having to know how to take pictures <laughs> or having to learn how to take pictures or figure out how to take pictures. And they got to be good ones because your product depends on it. I, I served as a volunteer staff photographer for our local historic site here in Mentor for a bunch of years and I found myself in the same situation where I didn't have much to work with and I needed to make it all look good and advertise to the general public without uh, too many resources and with no training at all whatsoever. So I uh, certainly have some tips and tricks that will help you along here. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if you uh, have not joined us before, uh, there is a helper I have behind the curtain. Uh, I see you all have found the chat box. Uh, I watch that chat box as the webinar goes on, and I will try to answer all of your questions. Now, because of the topic today, uh, I do have a professional photographer uh, who is manning that chat box. So my helper behind the curtain will take care of any of the uh, professional photographer-related questions that uh, I will not know the answers too. Again, my, my experience with this is a lot like your guys' experience. I have uh, on the fly, I don't know the proper professional terminology for some, of the, uh, for some of these things, but I can definitely give you lots of tips and tricks as to what to do to make sure you have quality photography for your t-shirt business. So with that being said, we are going to kick it off here. And as usual, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them as we go. I will do my best to answer them. Uh, if, I, if I do not answer your question verbally, it's because I'm waiting for my helper to do so. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get started. So the first question is why, why do we even bother having this discussion? Why is image quality important? Why, why do we even bother? Why isn't it just as easy as take a picture, stick it on the internet and go? <laughs> um, well, here's an interesting statistic for you. 67% uh, of consumers consider image quality to be very important when making a purchase. And now, any of you who are collectors of any kind, uh, putting t-shirts aside for a second, if you're a collector of any kind and you've ever gone on ebay.com, uh, we all know that image quality is important. I, I have a couple weird little things I collect uh, outside of the t-shirt business here. I love puzzle boxes. I don't know if you've ever seen a puzzle box before, but I love puzzle boxes. They're so cool. And uh, you go on eBay and you go to look at what they got. And, you know, you're always looking to add to your collection of whatever collectibles you, uh, you like. And uh, image quality is one of those things that can either detour you completely or turn you on to something. And uh, you could find the coolest item, but if the picture isn't great, you kind of feel weird about buying it, you know? Um, so good image quality is definitely something that is going to either make or break your product, especially if we're talking online sales, which is actually 
where my next slide is going. Um, marketing online, if you're doing most of your business online, you have to have good image quality. There's no question about it. Um, even if if you're trying to move your business online, because let's be honest here, uh, if if Transfer Express is going to serve as an example, when I started here many years ago, I've been with the company for 15 years. When we started, our online sales were just a teensy, eensy, weensy little bit of our 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 day to day business here at Transfer Express. Today, we take more than half, vast majority of our orders online. We know that the world itself is moving to an online platform. And all the social commentary aside, this means that for those of us in the t-shirt business, we have to have some kind of presence on the internet these days. Um, and if you're going to have an online presence, you have to have pho uh, photography of your products, and it has to be good looking. If the pictures of your products are hard to see or they're grainy or they look weird, people aren't going to purchase from you. You have to have good image quality. And keep in mind, when we're talking good image quality, I'm not talking about just clear photographs using like a, a high speed DSLR camera or anything like that. I'm talking about high quality photographs in the lighting and the background and the subject matter itself. And did you use a model? Did you not use a model? When I, when I talk good image quality, we're going beyond just is it a clear photograph? Is it pixelated? Um, so the whole point here is you have to have nice pictures to bring your customers in that that's just the honesty of it. And hopefully over the next 45 ish minutes, we're going to break it down a little bit. We're going to talk about all these different topics, give you some hints and tips and tricks. Some of these things, it's kind of funny as, as I learned about photography, doing it for the local historic site here, I, I kind of learned as I went and you, you sort of find out that some of these things aren't really rocket science. It's not brain surgery, but it's kind of funny how you didn't necessarily think of it before. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, that's where we're going to go today. All right. So first off, what are you going to need? Now, there's a couple directions we can go here. Uh, first off, obviously, a camera. Now, uh, we'll talk about buying or renting in just a second here. But uh, regardless of buying, renting, whatever, the first thing you need is a camera itself. Now, there's three directions you can go in terms of a camera. You got smartphones, you got point and shoots, and you have DSLRs. OK, now I, I've got them displayed from right to left here instead of left to right at the bottom of my slide. But you get the idea. Uh, now, smartphones, smartphones are great because the pictures uh, that they're capable of taking these days, a lot of these smartphones, their cameras are fantastic, um, much better than they used to be. OK, now we're talking the most recent smartphones, mind you. I'm not talking two, three year old smartphones. You got to be up on the technology. But there are smartphones that are totally comparable if we're talking photograph quality. OK, so smartphones are great because they're very compact. It's easy to get them around. It's easy to whip one out, take a picture. Um, now, if you're if you're doing high quality photography, then smartphones kind of fall to the wayside a little bit. You've got your point and shoots like my Canon in the middle there, and you've got your DSLRs like the Nikon on the far left hand side. Now, obviously, if budget allows a DSLR like that Nikon is the best way to go. These cameras are the highest quality photos. These are the cameras that you see people using for professional photography. Nikon is one of the brands that is more popular. Uh, if you're looking if you're in the market for a DSLR camera, obviously, I, I can't sit here and tell you all about the best brands, but I personally like the Canon Rebels. That's my choice. Uh, I have a friend who's really into the Pentax cameras, but when it comes down to it, those are the big brands, Pentax, Nikon, and Canon. And it comes, <laughs> there you go, James C., Canon all the way. Um, that's just my personal preference. I, there's nothing wrong with all of them. I, it's just like any other product. Dif different brands have the different functions and the different speeds and settings and all, all sorts of craziness, honestly. Um, and and it, it's <laughs> good input there, John. My iPhone has helped tremendously on eBay. I, funny how that works, isn't it? The iPhone camera quality these days, it's kind of crazy how, how nice those things are getting. But the, the point is, you have to have the camera first. Do you need a DSLR camera? No, of course you don't need one. Um, if you can get one, that's obviously optimal. The point and shoot cameras, like the one in the middle, honestly, the quality of those cameras is fantastic these days too. I, I have a tiny little Canon, actually, it might even be the model in the picture there, um, that I 
I tote around with me everywhere. It sits in my car. It, it comes into uh, stores with me and stuff. I always have it nearby. And uh, it's a fantastic little camera. I mean, if I'm doing high quality photography, am I going to use that? No, not necessarily. But these days, those point and shoot cameras are even fantastic. So honestly, it comes down to making sure whatever camera you've got your hands on is high quality. You don't want old cameras. You don't want the old cell phones. <laughs> Nikon or nothing, huh, Michael? Okay, well, you know what? I, I I will admit to you, Michael, I've never gotten to actually use a Nikon camera, so I, I guess I can't really talk too much there. So. Um, so when it comes down to it, it's more about the quality of the camera, less about the brand and the type. You can find smartphones that are just as good as a point-and-shoot camera. You just got to make sure you have the right one, okay? So that's the first step. Now, this is one of these funny little topics, backdrop. This is one of these funny little topics that people don't necessarily think about too much. You're going to have to ask yourself some questions here. You, you've got shirts. You're trying to sell. How do you want to photograph them? Because there's two ways you can go here. You can go with a white backdrop like I have in the pictures here. Um, now, when you're talking about a plain white backdrop, there's a couple different options. On the left-hand side, you see the continuous roll, the seamless roll of white paper. You know, what's nice about this is that you don't get, um, you don't get lines. You don't have to worry about angles and seams and that kind of thing. That continuous roll of paper gives you that white background where you can't see where the wall ends and where the floor begins. Very professional look, a very nice look. Obviously, it's a little bit costly and it can be hard to get your hands on one. So on the right-hand side, I've got a picture for you of using some white foam boards and constructing using white foam boards. Now, here's the funny part regardless. Even if you have uh, foam boards like on the right-hand side, you can still take a great picture uh, because of the lighting. We're going to talk about that in just a minute here. But having white on all sides of what you're photographing allows for really great uh, light and allows for a lot of brightness there. So that's why people tend to use the white boards or the seamless paper. Um, but again, it comes down to your preference. If you're not the white background kind of person or that this isn't the direction you're going to go, you need to stop and think about the locale you're going to shoot at. Is it going to be indoors or is it going to be outdoors? What's the lighting like? What is in the background of every single picture I take? Before you start shooting, you need to scout out the area you're going to be shooting at, and you need to seriously scrutinize what is in the background. OK, especially if you're going to do outdoors, at least indoors, you have some control over things. Outdoors, things can get hairy. So absolutely scout things out and seriously think about it before you waste a day of photography, especially if you're renting cameras or anything like that. Or if you're bringing in a photographer or models or anything, you don't want to waste anybody's time. So uh, a backdrop can be a white one like this here, or it can be an outdoor or an indoor shot with actual live action. Um, this is where photography classes, uh, and I'm definitely not a photography teacher, but this is where photography classes will start to talk about all the different, um, all the different uh, ways to go about doing things. Um, Kimberly's asking, will you be discussing best way to adjust lighting if using a white backdrop? You know what, Kimberly, I, I wasn't going to get into that much detail. <laughs> to be totally honest with you, Kimberly, it, it's I have some information as the webinar goes on. Yes, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some spotlights and such. Um, but it, it comes down to taking test shots, Kimberly. Sometimes when you've got your lighting all set up, you've got to take a test shot and see how it turns out. And you've got to adjust the lights. Remember, photography is one of those things that isn't as simple as take a picture done. Um, but anyway, the point about backdrops here, folks, is that you have to think about everything around you. Do you want it to be in a live action shot? Uh, because that's one of those things that connects with people these days. Um, some of the criticism to the white background photography like this is that uh, it's not real. It's not showing live action. If you have a model outside, then you're actually showing somebody in your shirt. There's a connection. There's an emotional a reaction to seeing a football player wearing a jersey actually in a uh, huddle as opposed to just taking a picture of a jersey on a white backdrop. But again, and just like James is saying here, I love the white backdrop outside. Some people do prefer that white backdrop look. This is one of the decisions you have to make about how you're displaying your product. White backdrop look or a live look. Ah, this is a great 
a great piece of information here, Gabriel. Amazon.com requires your products to have white backdrops. See, so absolutely, absolutely a great point. Um, and butcher paper works for shirts only. I agree, Michael. Very cool. Very cool. So uh, backdrops are just something to think about. Now, if, if you're going to do Amazon, like Gabriel has suggested here and commented, then yes, the white backdrop is necessary. If you're running your own website, obviously that's that's more your call than anything else. So let's move on from backdrops. Let's talk about light. Now, lighting is one of those funny little things that a lot of people don't tend to think about too much. You go, okay, well, my camera's got a flash. So <laughs> um, if you need light, first of all, daylight is your friend. The daylight's always going to be the best way to go. Uh, this is why I adore outdoor photography. A lot of the things I had to do was plant photography at a local wildlife at our national park. And daylight is gorgeous. It's it's always the best way to go. If you've got uh, bright, uh, big windows, you can do your photography indoors. Just make use of your windows. Um, like I have in the picture here, you see we've constructed a light box we put out right outside a back door. Uh, and it's funny because it's a great place to take that picture and you'd never know there's a back door right there. <laughs> um, I always get shadows indoors, it seems. You know, Kimberly, I totally understand. And that, honestly, Kimberly, that's where the placement of your lights is important. So this is kind of point number two on my slide here. Light clamps are a great source of light with whiteboards. You can get light, uh, light clamps at Home Depot or Lowe's. They're not that expensive, honestly. And it comes down to identifying, if you're going to do the photography indoors, you have to identify where the uh, shadows are coming from. And that's where you shine the lights at. And again, you're, you're going to need to take some test shots. You're not going to get it the first time. Trust me. Um, uh, you're going to have to play with it a little bit. And it's going to depend on the room you're in. Uh, it, does the room have overhead lighting? Is the room done by lamp lighting? Because that's a big problem too, let me tell you. So it, 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 it's, there's a lot that factors into the whole lighting concept. Um, it, it really comes down to just being cognizant of it. Um, now, if you have the budget to get strobe lights, those are the best. These are the lights that hook up to your camera. These are the lights that go off when you actually, uh, when the camera itself goes off. Alien Bees, Einsteins, or Profoto, these are some brands of the strobe lights that are great. At Transfer Express here, we use the Alien Bees lights. They're fantastic. Um, it, 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 again, this comes down to your budget, though. If, if you're like most of the mom and pop shops out there, and I'm sure you are, then it comes down to using daylight. Now, here's something I want to throw out to you. Even if you're going to use a live action background, you're not going to do the whole white background thing. Maybe you've got your own website and you don't have to have a white background uh, for Amazon necessarily. If you're going to do live action shots or you're going to do posed shots outdoors, then even having a reflective surface, uh, some kind of big white board is nice to have because the reflective surfaces or the white boards actually reflect light. And even if you're outside and you've got weird lighting outside or you've got um, stuff in the way, you want your lighting to be different, you can use reflective surfaces and white boards to actually give you more light where you're at. It's another good trick indoors too. Um, if you don't have the money to get light clamps or you don't have the money to do strobe lights, even if you're not going to be using a white background, that's half the reason people do use the white backgrounds because the uh, light reflects off of all those white surfaces and creates a really bright environment to take a picture. So it, it comes down to thinking about these sort of things when you're planning your photography out. Uh, stop and think about not only your background, but think about what lighting is in the area too. Think about how bright the pictures are going to be. If you found the perfect area in terms of looks for the background, but the lighting isn't fantastic, you need to ask yourself how you're going to overcome it. Well, thank you, James. I appreciate that. <laughs> Rob Gardner. You know, Rob, that's fantastic. I wouldn't have thought about that. A cheap way uh, for silver reflective is aluminum foil. It removes shadows. You know how silly. I never would have thought about that, Rob. That's a great idea. I never did aluminum foil. <laughs> that's great. I, I wouldn't have thought of that one. Okay. So let's throw this concept out there too. A lot of the mom and pop shops, a lot of you smaller businesses, you know you need to do the photography, but you don't necessarily have the money. Um, you don't have the equipment. Uh, you don't want to buy it. And maybe you want to do it one time and you never want to do it again. Uh, it, this is going to depend on how your business is set up, obviously. You can actually rent camera equipment. This is really not a big deal. And it's kind of funny because I, when I was doing the photography myself, 
I never thought about this. Now, after the idea was presented to me, I went ahead and hit Google because to be honest with you, I was a little bit skeptical, but lo and behold, if you Google camera rentals, there's a ton of places to get it. And for me, it looks like the most uh, reliable place here is borrowlenses.com. Uh, borrowlenses.com. But when I Googled it personally, I found actually a couple different camera rental facilities here in the Northeast Ohio area where Transfer Express is located. So um, renting cameras is definitely doable. And it's very possible for those of you who are sitting there going, well, gosh, I don't want to do this ever again. I don't want to go buy a camera only to use it one time. Uh, I totally feel you. So renting a, a camera equipment is definitely an option for you, okay? And what's, <laughs> frankly, what's nice about renting the equipment is that you can get some of the bits and pieces that you're not gonna have the money to buy anyway. So if you really don't wanna go with a point and shoot camera, if you really don't wanna go with a smartphone, you wanna go with a DSLR, but God help you, you don't have $500 to drop on a DSLR with the nice stuff, renting it is a great option. You can get a couple different lenses, you can get a stand, you can get all the bits and pieces you need to have the professional look to those photos. So it's just another way to look at things. Um, you, and again, James, that's a great idea. I never would have thought of that. Uh, James is telling us also, if you don't have a camera, you can always go to local colleges or high schools. And many times professors will assign students to shoot for you as a project assignment. You know, that's a great point. Our local high school here in Mentor has a photography class. So I would imagine a lot of the uh, high schools across the country do. Uh, I believe our local community college does uh, photography classes as well for that matter. So that's a fantastic idea, James. All right, so let's talk about models. This is one of those things where we have very, very differing opinions on this. Now, in terms of models, um, you have the option of using models, live people, or you have the option of using models such as mannequins and that kind of thing. And it's going to come down to who you have at your disposal. Um, what's great about using models is that somebody can actually see what it looks like on a human body. As great as mannequins are and as easy as mannequins are to work with, <laughs> they pose exactly the way you want them to. Um, as great as mannequins are to work with sometimes, showing a, a garment on a real person, you, you can't really beat that uh, because it doesn't matter what mannequin you snag, the proportions are never going to be right. Um, so uh, models are great just for that reason alone. People can see the fit. People can see the way that it looks on an actual shirt, on an actual person, just so that they see the way the shirt falls even, you know, where the seams end up, how long it is, where the waist ends up being. If you have it on a mannequin, uh, mannequin waists can be totally disproportionate to where on a human, I can see that, oh, okay, you know what, that size, a little bit short for me, I'm going to go to the next size up. Uh, if you're going to do the whole model thing, make sure to work with somebody who you're comfortable with um, and uh, make sure that you actually plan for that specific model. Um, we do uh, we use models here at Transfer Express for our idea book photo shoots, and we're, we have to make the shirts actually to the model size. Um, obviously, if the model you're going to be working with is a really tall individual, well, then a regular medium or XL might not work. You might have to go with a actual tall size shirt is the point here. Um, or you don't want to have a small model and a massive shirt that they're swimming in. So plan ahead, think about the actual model that you're using, who you're working with, and make sure that the shirt you make for the photo shoot actually reflects that model's size. Hold that thought, James. I'm getting there on the next slide. <laughs> um, and here's another thing to throw out there for you. Having a long-term relationship with your model can be very beneficial to your company because it gives you brand consistency. If you find somebody who's got a unique look and they can do the modeling for you and you can continue to call them back over and over again, then you have the same look. Uh, now, to some of us, that's something that we like for our websites or for our Amazon stores or what have you, our Etsy stores. We like to have the same look over and over again. It's the proportions of the person per se. It's not necessary um, but it's definitely doable. So Jerry's asking here, is it possible to take a few stock photos and put the, and put mock-ups on the models? You know, it's honestly, it's possible, Jerry, but here's the catch. If, if you're talking about actually taking a picture of a shirt and then putting graphics on the shirt, like we're talking Photoshopping, that's a whole different kind of webinar, Jerry. <laughs> um, it's a whole different kind of webinar. It's possible. Uh, we've actually done that here at Transfer Express, but 
it, the problem that you have there using that train of thought where you're going to take a picture of a person wearing a blank shirt and then put a graphic on that shirt digitally in terms of like photo manipulation. Now you suddenly have to be good at photo manipulation to do that because it's not as simple as just putting a graphic onto a photograph. It, I guarantee you that no matter how meticulous you are, it's not actually going to look like that graphic is on that shirt. So, um, Anyhow, uh, using models is definitely a great way to go about doing this. Uh, how much should the model be paid? You know what, Wilfredo, that's one of those things that you have to justify based on who you're working with. Uh, if we're talking about kids, if we're talking about young adults, this can be something that can be a very cheap experience, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, it, it can also be sold to them as a way for them to start portfolios if you're talking to somebody who actually wants to get into real modeling. Pizza! Exactly, James, that's what I'm talking about. Um, you don't have to go about paying these people a lot necessarily. Uh, if you're working with professional models, Wilfredo, that's a whole different story, and I will let my uh, behind-the-scenes photographer uh, answer that question because I am not actually sure. <laughs> All right, so uh, somebody was asking about this for just a second there, uh, giving your model direction. So in terms of poses, this is one of these things that you wanna think about. James was asking, so how do, you, how do you pose your model? Remember, you are taking pictures of the shirt, folks. You are not trying to be uh, the photographer for Vogue magazine or Marie Claire. You're not trying to take a fashion shot of Tyra Banks. You're trying to take a picture of the shirt itself. Oh, I'm sorry, Nicole. I'm, I, I'm not sure why the sound's going in and out. I, everything looks okay on my end here. So the recording will be clear, Nicole, I promise. Uh, in the meantime, though, in, in terms of the model direction, you have to remember you're shooting pictures of the shirt. So whatever you tell your model to do, you want to ensure that you can see the shirt clearly. Now, you obviously want the model to look good in what they're doing. You don't want them to be posed in goofy poses. Um, you don't want somebody thrusting their chest out and their shoulders back and looking goofy in a picture necessarily. Uh, but you want to make sure that whatever pose you're having them strike, that you can clearly see their chest, the shirt, wherever the design that you're focusing on is at. So you can see in this example here... Um, the example that we've got here, this gentleman, it's a really simple pose. He's standing. He's obviously got his weight shifted onto one leg. He's got his hands in his pockets, but his arms are thrust backwards a little bit. It looks like a totally natural pose, and it puts his chest front and center, which is where the transfer is at. Now, the other point that I'm making here on this slide is that the way your model is looking is just as important as the way you actually pose them. OK, so in terms of where the model is looking, you can have them looking directly at the camera. You can have them looking at the floor. You can have them looking at something in the distance. The point is to give your model direction. Tell them what you want them to do. OK, now this is where hopefully you're working with somebody who knows their body well enough that when you say, hey, I need your chest to be front and center, that they know what to do to strike that pose. The other catch that you guys want to think about when you're posing your models is the shirt is the most important. So you don't want them to do any goofy poses that the shirt is going to wrinkle. All right. So doing crazy things with their arms, putting their arms out or up above their heads or waving their arms around that kind of thing. You don't want to do that because the shirt itself is going to wrinkle. And then you're interrupting the most important part of the shot, which is the shirt you're trying to sell. <laughs> so uh, be cognizant of that kind of thing. Um, and again, it comes down to uh, making sure that you're paying attention to the most important part of the photograph, which is the shirt itself. So here are some examples um, just to give you a couple more ideas. And again, one of the nice things about hiring models is that they can actually give your products personality. They can give your products some attitude. And it's kind of funny how that works. Now, again, all of these models, their shirts are relatively unwrinkled in the place where the transfer is displayed. Uh, you can see their chest front and center, so it would be easy to display graphics on these models. Okay, so it would be easy to actually use these as, as actual advertisement photos. So, um, again, it, it's just neat how the right model with the right look can actually give your garment some attitude. So, um, 
and uh, again, you'll notice that most of these, their arms are at their sides, their chest is front and center. Uh, if their uh, uh, elbows are bent, they're bent uh, towards the sides a little bit backwards there. You don't want anything to get in the way. You want to make sure that you've got a clear shot of the important part. <laughs> this is this is a great point, James. Make sure the wrinkles are actually out of the garment on the models. Yeah, this is this is where steamers are a beautiful thing. Have a steamer <laughs> on location with you, or your heat press, of course. Heat presses are great for getting wrinkles out too. Um, but no, honestly, garment steamers are great because they help get those wrinkles out. And you know, you can find pretty decently effective steamers at a at a pretty decent price these days. It's not like it was ten years ago where a garment steamer is going to cost you an arm and a leg. So. Um, Definitely another great point, though, yes. All right, so let's talk about photography not using a model. Let's talk about flat surfaces. you got two different ways you can go here, and you'll notice that since we've gotten off of the models, we're doing the whole white background with these flat garments here. Um, you've got two different thought processes. On the left, you've got the wrinkled garment, which gives that crew neck some personality. Uh, but then on the right, you've got the perfectly... Uh, folded, perfectly flat surface of this polo shirt. And again, um, be sure to use a steamer for shot, uh, shots like that so it's not uh, not wrinkled at all. But again, it's it's up to you. I'm afraid of wrinkles. You know, it, it all comes down to what you want to do and the look that you want to give it. I, I think it comes down to a statement about uh, being casual. Uh, today, um, we see people with the uh, the sleeves that are cut off and the uh, cut off necks. Um, think uh, Jennifer Beals flash dance. We see those kind of fashions coming back, and we see that uh, a casual wear thought process is very popular. So honestly, James, the way to look at it is the wrinkles, and we're not talking like crazy wrinkles where obviously somebody was sitting on that sweater all day, um, but they look more. Uh, comfortable. It looks like it's an actual garment as opposed to something that was photoshopped. So it, it's just something to think about. This is one of those. And, and you know what? In the end, we're talking about for photographing a wrinkled shirt versus a flat shirt. Does it sound like the biggest deal in the world? Of course not. It's not the biggest deal in the world. But you have to think about the message that your photograph is sending. If you're going to make this t-shirt business your livelihood, if this is going to be the big deal to you, then you owe it to yourself to think about this kind of stuff. So I, I tend to be in the method of thinking that the wrinkles give it a lived-in look. It gives it a look that this is something comfortable that somebody would wear. That's just my personal opinion. If your business is more based on uh, the business wear and uh, the polo shirts of trade shows and professional companies and uniforms and that kind of stuff, then yes, I absolutely would rather have the picture on the right-hand side. So I guess part of this actually does come down to asking yourself what the main part of your business is. Um, so Derek is asking why the pick on the left has background showing. Um, honestly, Derek, the pick on the left, you can see a little bit of the background because the background wasn't perfectly white. Uh, it was kind of an off whitey color and it's interacting with the white of my slide. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about mannequins for a hot second here. Mannequins are just, it's such a goofy topic uh, because, first of all, there's 10 million different kind of mannequins out there. And and you can get the artsy-fartsy mannequins that look neat and all, but they're proportioned weird. You can get armless mannequins. You can get headless mannequins. It, it, it all comes down to uh, it, the alternative to having an actual human model. So whoever was asking how much do you pay models, well, hey, you don't have to pay your mannequin. Uh, so this is just another option. Um, but what we wanted to throw out there, the, pre the place where people go wrong with these mannequins is that you get the mannequins that aren't shaped like normal people or they don't have normal people parts. Like on the left hand side here, we've got a chick with no arms. So uh, not helpful because that doesn't show somebody how the shirt actually looks. Now, I, I can speak from experience here that the girls in the office love these kinds of low cut shirts with the uh, cap sleeves like that. But the problem I have heard more than one time when girls order these shirts from Alpha Broder or from Sanmar, they get them and go, oh, my God, the sleeves aren't where I thought they would be. Because if they saw it on a real person, they'd be able to identify where the sleeves would actually end up falling. Um, at least the mannequin on the left is actually the torso of a woman so they can see exactly how low cut it is. The point 
being here. If you're going to go the route of a mannequin as opposed to using a real human being, there's definitely some benefits. Make sure it's a mannequin that looks like a real person. Don't go high concept artsy mannequins that are half person, half rectangle shapes and that kind of stuff. Don't don't do it because in the end you're doing yourself a grave disservice. You're not actually showing people what a garment's going to look like. You're trying to mix in creative photography, which is not not where we're going here. So uh, here's some more ideas. Now, this is actually a cool concept here. We've got, uh, we've actually got these shirts on a display form. Now, a display form, uh, you've seen these before. It's that um, the ones we have here uh, at Transfer Express, they're uh, a black uh, half of, front half of somebody's torso. Um, but what we've done is we've done this neat little Photoshoppy effect where we've taken a picture of the shirts on the dress form, um, and you can see it most clearly on the one on the far right, actually, the muscle shirt on the gray background. We've taken a picture of the shirt on the dress form, and then we've actually Photoshopped the collar so that it looks like the shirt is just floating there. You don't actually see the dress form here, do you? Do you? <laughs> um, we call that uh, ghost mannequin style photography, and we're actually going to do a blog on this topic. So if any of you guys think this is a neat, neat idea, our uh, resident photography expert, Natasha, is going to do a fun blog on this where she's going to explain to you guys how to actually make this work for you. Um, I agree. Isn't this a cool idea, Debbie? I, I think it's neat because it sets you aside a little bit. It makes you look even more professional that you can pull something like this off. And here's the funny part is it's actually not the biggest deal in the world. Um, it, it's not that difficult to Photoshop out the chunks of the dress form that you want. Um, but I'm going to let Natasha explain that via blog. Make sure you're subscribed to the transferexpress.com blog, though. So this is going to be upcoming here. Um, we're looking forward to putting that out there. Ah, good point, Matt. Then we need Photoshop template to lay the graphic on the garment. Um, you know what? Actually, to be honest with you, Matt, that's not where we were going exactly. The picture here I'm just showing you is the idea of this ghost mannequin style. Honestly, Matt, if if I were you, I would have the shirt already decorated with a with a graphic on it. Um, in the slide, I'm just illustrating the concept of the uh, ghost mannequin style. So. Um, I would make sure it's a decorated shirt, though. Uh, that's the same question somebody else asked earlier. And it doesn't matter how good you are with Photoshop unless the graphic is perfect and unless the shirt is perfectly flat. You're not going to be able to convince somebody that the graphic is actually on it. So just my personal opinion from having tried it before. <laughs> okay. So again, uh, more examples of photography on a display form, except this time we're showing how you actually, display forms are nice because you can rotate a little bit. It, this can be the same for mannequins too, to be honest with you. Um, you have the option of getting uh, an exact same front, back, and side shot. Of course, you can do this with a real human model, but it's hard to get them to be exactly the same, the front and the back, and stand it perfectly still, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, this is nice for the internet again too, because now you can display the front of your shirt, the back of your shirt, the sleeves if you want, uh, depending, of course, on what you're selling and what you're doing. Um, but uh, display forms are nice and mannequins are nice for this because it just it's easy just to take a shot, rotate, take a shot, rotate, so forth. So we wanted to show you an example of a home setup. Um, now, this is, again, uh, courtesy of our photography expert here at Transfer Express, Natasha. This is a great example of a home setup. And, and you see it's actually not hard to pull off. Um, this person did find that continuous roll of white. And, and here's the funny part. The way they have this set up that continuous roll of white, totally not necessary to be the continuous deal. They really could have taken this and just done a solid piece of white paper and laid it on the floor, to be totally honest with you. And then having the camera on a tripod placed above the t-shirt, this is fantastic because they can actually choose to do the wrinkled look or the smoothed out look. Um, it's, it's very flexible this way. It's the perfect way to set this up. And you see this person has gone so far as to have some really nice uh, lights. The umbrellas diffuse the light a little bit, gives it a softer look. Um, so uh, definitely a great way to go. Do you have to go this fancy schmancy? No, of course not. Um, there are ways to do this set up without having to have all of these nice fancy pantsy things, but it is very possible.
It is very, very possible. Um, so Kimberly is asking a great question here. She's asking them where to get display forms. Here's the good news. Honestly, Kimberly, if you Google display forms, you are going to find a whole lot of options. <laughs> if you Google display forms, you're going to find a whole lot of options. You can find display forms that are just top parts of certain torsos. You can find down to thigh level. You can find all kinds of different things. Honestly, um, I tend to like the display forms, um, there is a uh, store supply warehouse is the link. I, I tend to like that display form uh, store supply warehouse. That's just me. Um, they've got a lot of options there too, and their prices seem to be good. Uh, I've never ordered from there specifically though. So I would challenge you to uh, Google that though, Kimberly. <laughs> okay. So this is an example of a home base setup. Um, so post-processing. Now, this is where things can get a little bit hairy. Up until this point, we've been talking about the ability to take a good photograph, to think about your background, to think about your lighting, to think about how you've positioned your model. These are things that all of us can do if we have an aesthetic eye. Post-processing is where the computer part comes into play. We've already talked about Photoshop a couple times now. Um, and it, it seems like a difficult task for first-timers. It seems like the thing that we want to get hung up on. However, post-processing is not that difficult. Now, Adobe Photoshop is probably the most common. It's to a point where the word Photoshop is becoming a verb in the English language. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's not that difficult to get into photo uh, Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, but I have some suggestions for you guys out there. Um, what about training on Corel Draw? Honestly, Amber, Corel is not the program you're going to want to use uh, for photo manipulation. At least not Corel Draw. Corel has a program um, called Corel Photo Paint. Um, I would call it not nearly as nice as Photoshop, but I've got a better suggestion. For those of you mom and pops out there who don't have access to Photoshop, there is a couple great free resources out there for you guys. I personally, when I was doing this for our historic site, they didn't have the money to purchase a copy of Photoshop. So I ended up having to go out and find the free software. I honestly, there's tons of free softwares out there for you to do the post-processing of your images. PickMonkey.com, P-I-C-K-M-O-N-K-E-Y, PickMonkey.com is phenomenal. You can uh, purchase a... Uh, you can purchase a, a monthly package from PicMonkey. That's fantastic. Their software is easy to use. It's all web-based. You don't have to download anything. Um, oh, there you go, Stephen. Uh, you know, I never used GIMP, but Picasa. Picasa is super popular. Uh, a lot of people use Picasa. I honestly stuck to PicMonkey and Pixlr, uh, P-I-X-L-R. I found those two to be the easiest to use and the easiest to learn, just my personal opinion. Um, but they're both free is the point. Uh, all these options are free. So if you don't have the money to go the Adobe Photoshop route, you can go the route of the free software. Regardless, post-processing is one of those things that you want to play around with. Um, we're going to have a blog on this in a, in a future date as well, in addition to that whole uh, ghost model uh, concept we talked about a second ago. But this is one of those things that you want to think about because you're going to take great pictures as you go along, as you get some practice, you're going to take great photography. But every now and then, you're going to have that picture that looks really cool, but you want to crop out the background, you want to get rid of something, um, you want to adjust the light levels, you want to play with the contrast a little bit. You basically, you want to tweak your picture because you want it to be perfect. That's why you do post-processing. That's why you upload your pictures to Picasa or to PicMonkey or Pixlr. That's why you use Photoshop. So, um, or there you go, Michael. I pay $9.99 a month for Photoshop. That's a great point. I, you Honestly, Photoshop is getting much, much more easily accessible. Um, I, if, if you have the 10 bucks a month, I, I would do it, absolutely. So post-processing, this is, uh, honestly, guys, this is a topic that Natasha and I could probably go on for a full 45 minutes on this topic alone. Um, there's going to be a blog coming up about it, though. So honestly, the whole point is to experiment. Don't be afraid. That's the most important part. Don't be afraid. This should not be the thing that detours you from doing your own photography. Uh, if you're 
unsure, if you're nervous about this, I challenge you to go online, find just a stock photograph, do a Google image search, take a stock photograph of something, anything, it doesn't matter. Then go to pickmonkey.com, pixlr.com, go to Picasa and upload that picture and play with it. And you will find yourself discovering that it's not that difficult. Honestly, the days of Photoshop being this forbidden program that nobody knows how to use and it's so difficult to learn, those days are over. So don't be afraid of doing your own photography based on this post-processing. This should not be the thing that detours you. All right, colors. So uh, color accuracy is really important, especially when we're talking about people that are shopping online. This is one of those reasons why light is such an important, <laughs> such an important deal, um, or also uh, white balance on your camera settings. Um, what we've got here is three pictures of the same shirt, but you mess with the light settings a little bit. You mess with the white settings on your shirt, and you can see how you can make a, a, a shirt go from a light gray to a dark gray with just messing around with the settings. Um, I, I know, right? This is kind of crazy. So you want to make sure that your settings on your camera are right. You want to make sure that you're checking your pictures as you go. This is one of those things that you learn to do before you really commit to a picture. Take a shot, look at it, make sure it looks good. Then you move on and you keep going. Um, but uh, this is also why lighting is so important too. So, All right. So um, either way, guys, what we've been talking about here, the creativity part of this, this is all up to you. There's so many different ways to photograph your apparel. There's so many different things to think about it. And, and remember that when it comes down to it, you want to do something that sets you aside from everybody else. That ghost model for, uh, photography concept, that's so cool because it sets you aside from your competitors. If that's not your thing, then find something that does set you aside. Maybe it's a location. Maybe it's a look. Maybe it's a certain thing you do with your photography. But remember that that you got to be creative about it. Do something different. Make yourself stand out. Give yourself some personality. Get creative. Get comfortable with the photography. Get comfortable using the camera. And then go out there and find something neat. Find something different that's going to set you aside from everybody else. All right. So uh, by doing this, you're obviously going to please your customers. You're going to make your customers happy. Remember that you have to have the photography looking good on your websites regardless. Even if you're just doing your business through Amazon or through Etsy, if, you're, if the pictures of your shirts stink, then people aren't going to buy them. Um, you don't want pixelation. You don't want backgrounds that are too loud. Remember that if you've got too much going on in your background, if you've got uh, a crazy beautiful nature backgrounds, that kind of thing, you might be overpowering the t-shirt. <laughs> you don't want too many colors. You don't want too much action. Um, it, you just got to think about this kind of stuff. And, and in the end, all it's going to do is please your customers. It's going to make you a more viable source for their t-shirts. So uh, I hope everybody got something out of this. I hope everybody uh, absorbed something that you might not have thought about before. Um, I, I appreciate you all joining us today. Uh, this was a lot of fun for Natasha and I to present to you all. Um, if you have any questions, please, please don't hesitate to give us a call or email us. Uh, specifically, if you have questions about the photography topic, I would definitely email because um, our, our phone reps aren't really going to have uh, too much that they can tell you about in terms of photography. <laughs> so give us an email at info at transferexpress.com. Check our blog out, though. Uh, the blog is going to have uh, the blog is going to have the stuff that we talked about. And, uh, we're going to do some blogs about the post processing. We're going to do some blogs about the ghost photography stuff. Um, so definitely, definitely subscribe to the blog. Um, and hit us up next month. Um, thank you for all joining me. I saw a whole bunch of names I recognized in today's attendees. Thank you guys for coming every month. I appreciate you. Um, uh, we are going to be joining you next month, May 12th, for how to create your own artwork, easy and free. We've got some really neat things to show you with our Easy View Online design system. And, and for the first time in 10 years, guys, it's not going to be me joining you. Uh, we're going to have a different member of our learning and development department join you next month. So um, you're, you'll 
you'll get to hear somebody else for the first time in, in uh, 10 years of me doing these webinars. So uh, Jessica is just as prepared as I am, and she's going to deliver a fantastic webinar for you. So uh, I promise you guys will enjoy it. So join us next month. And in the meantime, if you want to discuss this photography topic more, shoot an email to us. We are more than happy to help you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate all of you coming, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, folks.